Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, it's 1.59. Uh, we are going to start in about 60 seconds, so hold tight. We're going to give everybody a chance to log on, but uh, we will be starting our webinar really soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 2 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started with today's 1031 Exchange webinar. My name is Leonard Spoto, and I've got on the uh, phone call with me Matt Ferenci, my business development manager. Um, uh, we are going to talk about 1031 Exchange today, so um, welcome aboard the webinar. And before we get started, I have a couple announcements to make. So um, number one Everybody who has logged on to the webinar today is going to get a copy of all of the presentation material that we go over. So our slides are available to you. Feel free to take notes if you want, but keep in the back of your mind, you're going to get a copy of today's presentation emailed over to you. And that occurs about an hour after the presentation ends, so just keep an eye out in your email for that. The second thing I wanted to uh, mention to you all is that during the course of the webinar, Matt and I are going to kind of trade off uh, talking, and something Matt or I say might trigger a question that you might have, and we welcome any and all questions. Now, the way that you ask a question on a webinar is you simply type it in, and it will pop up on my computer screen. And what I will do is I will try to read your question. If it's a really long, detailed question and, it, and it's hard for me to read, um, I might save those for the end of the presentation, but I try to address all of your questions as they are pertinent. Sometimes I get overwhelmed with questions, and in those cases, we, we usually just kind of wait until the end of the presentation and just log through one by one each of the uh, the questions. But the point is, if you have a question, I want to hear it, and uh, the way you get it over to me is you simply type it in. Now, if you're if you're confused on where to type, just take a look at your webinar control panel. On that control panel, there is a little section called uh, called questions. You just open that section up and you type your question in there and you push send and it will come on over to me. So um, thank you all for joining. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, we have actually uh, included a little bit of information today about opportunity zones. So we get asked quite a bit about opportunity zones and um, we're going to talk a little bit about them. So um, you, you might know a little bit, you might know nothing, but I will tell you there is a ton of misinformation out there. So we're going to try to clear up a little bit of that misinformation, and I'll be doing that towards the end of the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's 1031 Exchange presentation. Uh, again, I'm your host as well as Matt Ferenci, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand the mic over to Matt. He's going to tell you a little bit of background information about Asset Exchange Company. Matt? Yeah, thanks, Leonard. So today, is like Leonard mentioned, we're going to be talking about the 1031 Exchange. Now, essentially, we are a full-service 1031 exchange accommodator and as a full service 1031 exchange accommodator our job isn't to sell real estate or to sell say title insurance it's simply to facilitate 1031 exchanges now essentially all exchange accommodators do the same thing um, which is that we just we hold the funds for you while you do your 1031 exchange so that you are in fact in, uh, you aren't in constructive receipt of the sale proceeds. We also make sure that we properly document your transaction and ensure that you are in compliance with the tax code on your sale. Now, 
essentially all exchange accommodators do the same thing, except where they differ in their level of is where they differ is in their level of service. So for our company, we've been around since 2006, and the company was started by Leonard Spoto and Adam Skarsgård, who's a tax attorney. And we carry substantial errors and emissions insurance, as well as a fidelity bond through our company in the event that there is ever some sort of financial loss on your transaction. And in addition, we offer free audit support for our clients. And this one is pretty important, which I'll get back to in a moment. Um, but we're also a member of the California Board of Accountancy and a member of the State Bar of California because one of our founders, Adam Skarsgård, is in fact a tax attorney. Now, the reason we bring, bring up the free audit support is when you do a 1031 exchange and your transaction is ever audited, essentially what would likely happen is you would have to go to a tax or real estate attorney that specializes in 1031 exchanges. Now, more than likely, that particular tax attorney wouldn't know as much about 1031 exchanges as we do simply because it's something that we facilitate every single day. Now, although we can't represent you in tax court, what we can do is we can provide free audit support and hopefully ensure that you never have to go to tax court by citing private letter rulings and citing the requisite case law to ensure that you are in compliance with the tax code. Now, from this slide up here, which I'm about to go over, you'll see that it's incredibly important that you follow the rules when you do a 1031 exchange. In worst case scenario, if you were ever audited on your 1031, your transaction would be disqualified and maybe you pay some kind of penalty. The worst case scenario is that you can actually go to jail or prison for tax fraud. And that's actually what happened with a realtor called Cheryl Savage back in 2013. So back in 2013, Cheryl Savage was actually sentenced to 14 months in prison and was ordered to pay a $10,000 fine and $123,000 in restitution for tax evasion. And essentially, here's what happened. Cheryl owned a couple of rental properties and she had a pretty substantial gain from the sale of those properties. And of course, understandably, she didn't want to pay taxes on the sale of those properties, which you can imagine is pretty high, especially in the state of California. But what she wanted to do was take the funds from the sale of those properties and purchase a primary residence. And that is a severe no-no. When you do a 1031 exchange, you cannot purchase a primary residence with 1031 exchange funds. And this was something that she knew. However, she decided to move forward with the transaction anyways, and to make it seem like the transaction was legitimate and the replacement was a investment property, she decided to falsify income on her tax returns. So she pretended like there was rental income being generated there when in fact there was none. And of course, once she was audited, IRS said, okay, well, what is this? This is clearly not right. And they made her pay a pretty significant price, as you can see from the headline. Now, this is pretty important to note for a couple of reasons. Uh, in that particular situation, Cheryl said that she didn't, in fact, know that you can't do a 1031 exchange and purchase a primary residence. Uh, of course, the IRS didn't buy this for one main reason, because Cheryl actually decided that she's going to put that she is a 1031 exchange expert on her website. Now, that is what one might call an epic fail, so that did not, in fact, fly. But the other reason that this is, in fact, important is because even if she didn't know the rules of the 1031 exchange, essentially, you're not knowing those rules is not an excuse for you. The IRS is, doesn't care if you know the rules or not, they just wanna see that you follow them, which is why it's incredibly important that you choose an accommodator carefully when you do your 1031 exchange so that you follow all the rules and don't end up like Cheryl Savage did. And with that, I'll actually turn it back to Leonard to go over a couple of our more recent transactions that in fact did not turn out with any jail time for any of our clients.
Leonard? Yeah, and thanks, Matt. It, it is. Uh, I'm kind of chuckling here as Matt's talking about this because you know you, you think, well, geez, this this seems, as Matt mentioned, an ep- epic fail, right? I mean, this is just clearly not what you want to do. But I will tell you that I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and there probably is not a week that goes by when somebody doesn't call us on the phone and ask us how to do this, right? So how can I sell my rental property and buy myself a new, giant, fat, cozy primary residence? Well, you can't. Well, well, what if I do this? And what if I fake this? And what if I fake that? Well, if you end up faking stuff, that is tax fraud. And tax fraud is a criminal offense. So well said, Matt. And I think this just really exemplifies the, the need to uh, to do your exchanges properly and to work with a company like ours that can defend you in the position that you took. Now, um, we did not work with Cheryl. Um, had we worked with Cheryl, we would have told her, hey, this is a big no-no. Um, but some of the clients that we've worked with have done some pretty successful uh, and pretty interesting exchanges. So let me go over just a couple of the exchanges that we've worked on in, in the past. And let's start at the very top here. So this is the Galaxy Office Park in Concord, California. It sold several years ago, and it was a sale price of $42 million. There is a couple LLCs. The, the clients came to me and they said, well, geez, we don't, we're not quite sure which we're, what we're going to buy yet. And when we sell this building, we're going to close escrow and we're going to have $30 million of cash after we pay off our loan. And the question they asked me was this. When we close escrow, can we invest that $30 million into treasury bonds and some investments so that we can actually actively manage our money until we find something to buy. And Matt touched on this a little bit earlier. The answer is absolutely not. When you do a 1031 exchange, you cannot be in constructive receipt of your sale proceeds. So I don't care if you're selling a $42 million building or a $420,000 building. When that property sells, you cannot touch the money, right? The money comes to us, sits in a neutral third-party account until you are ready to purchase the replacement property. Now, why is that? Because the IRS says so, right? You get this great tax break, this deferral of taxes, but you've got to follow the rules. Think of it like your 401k or your IRA, right? You're going to have some tax-free investment opportunities, but in order to qualify for those tax deferred or tax advantage programs, you have to follow the rules, and one of which is you need to use a custodian to hold your funds, and we are that custodian. So very important, do not touch your funds. Also very important if you're going to do an exchange, especially if it's a big building and there's a huge tax consequence if you mess up, make sure you get your exchange account set up prior to closing escrow. All right, you can't touch the money, you can't be in constructive receipt of those funds. So if you closed on Friday and you call me on Monday to set up your exchange account, you are going to be out of luck. If you tell me, hey, Leonard, I didn't even touch the money, I don't care, right? You closed on Friday, you didn't call me till Monday, you're out of luck, the government is going to tax your transaction, all right? So very, very, very important. Now let's take another uh, a, a look at another property that uh, we worked on that illustrates some additional interesting points about the 1031 exchange process. How about the Sandy Springs apartment project here in Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia? Now this was a $26 million building. And what's interesting about this specific property is that it was owned by 27 individuals. Now, the reason why I talk about this property is because the taxpayer who owns real estate is the taxpayer who can exchange the real estate. So how many individuals, individual taxpayers own this property? Well, because they own the property as tenant in common, there are 27 individual taxpayers. And what's great about this ownership structure from a 1031 exchange perspective is that when this building sells, each of the individual owners can do their own exchange or not. 
And it really doesn't matter what anyone else in the group is doing, right? So Bob raises his hand. He's an owner. He says, you know what? I don't want to exchange. Fine. The other 26, they can do their own exchanges. They can buy together. They can go separately. It just doesn't matter. There's 27 individual taxpayers on title to the real estate. Each of them can make their own independent decision regarding what they want to do with their tax bill. Either defer it with an exchange or pay it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is not always the case, all right? Imagine these 27 individuals did not take title as tenant and common owners, and instead they formed an LLC to take title to the property, all right? An LLC is essentially a partnership, and when you have a partnership with two or more members, that partnership is going to file its own taxpayer or its own tax return and have its own taxpayer identification number. So had these individuals formed an LLC to hold title when the property sold for 26 million bucks, who can do the exchange? Only the LLC. And if Bob raises his hand and says, no, 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 I don't want to exchange, guess what? They're all going to have to pay taxes. The LLC itself is going to pay taxes, and everybody loses out on the opportunity to exchange. All right. Now, this comes up all the time, ladies and gentlemen. People go into real estate as best friends. They own an apartment building together. Five years later, they hate each other. They want to go their separate ways. But unfortunately, when they originally structured the ownership of the property, they did it within an LLC or a partnership, all right? And now they're stuck together if they want to defer taxes. So very, very important, if you are a investor or a realtor who is selling a building that's owned by a group, you want to know how that group owns the property, all right? Because it might negate their ability to go forward and do an exchange if just one of those individuals involved in the ownership doesn't want to do an exchange. All right. Very, very important, ladies and gentlemen. The taxpayer who owns the real estate is the taxpayer who sells. Taxpayers can be people like you and me, but taxpayers can also be corporations, partnerships, trusts. So very important to know if you have an entity that is a taxpayer on title. Very, very important for our 1031 exchange. All right. Last building here, and I only really even talk about this building because it's kind of interesting. Um, this building was a very famous building in San Francisco on the corner of Mission Street. It was the Armory Building. We worked with a seller of this property last year to sell this building and do an exchange. He sold it for 65 million bucks and he bought about 30 replacement properties. Now, I like to brag because it's a pretty big deal, but if you Google that property, it's also got a very interesting past. And don't Google it at work because it's a not so safe for work type of building. And if you do end up Googling it at home later on, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, all right. And uh, Gerald, I do see your question there. It's a big question. We're going to go over that uh, stuff uh, in a bit. So um, just a couple deals we've worked on. And with that, um, what I want to do is pass the mic back over to Matt, and he's going to talk you through some of the reasons why some of our clients, both big and small, are doing their 1031 exchanges. Yeah, thanks, Leonard. So there are essentially four main reasons why investors want to do 1031 exchanges. Now, I'm sure the most obvious here is the first one, which is that Clients want to defer paying capital gains taxes on the sale of their property because when they sell an investment property, approximately one third of the total gain from the sale is going to go to taxes. And especially if you're in a place like California, you know, you'll see a lot of appreciation on your property and you'll have a lot of gain. But that also means a pretty significant tax bill. So, for example, if, you know. 33% approximately of your gain is going to the government, you know, clients really don't want to pay that if they don't have to, which is a great reason to exchange in the first place. But it's not just about 
the taxes that you are deferring, it's also what you're able to do with those taxes. Because with the 1031, you can also buy more property. And what happens is the taxes that you otherwise would have paid to the government can now be utilized to leverage into, say, a larger property, maybe from a two-unit apartment building into a four-unit apartment building that can generate, say, greater rental income and greater return on investment. Now, that's a pretty significant advantage because a lot of our clients like to generate wealth. And in fact, the 1031 Henk Exchange has been called the single greatest wealth building tool available to real estate investors. So it's a pretty powerful tool when it comes to accumulating wealth. But a lot of our clients also already have wealth. And at that point, they really aren't just looking to uh, generate even more wealth. They're looking to diversify. And there are a couple of ways that you can actually diversify. The first being geographic diversification. Now with geographic diversification, let's say that you own 50 rental units somewhere in maybe Miami where it's nice and sunny. Sure to love to own a bunch of properties down there, but there's one problem with say Miami, which is there are a lot of hurricanes. And if a large hurricane were to ever hit Miami and hit all those properties, that could do some serious damage to my portfolio. So what I can do is maybe 25 of those properties I can exchange into Texas where you don't have to deal with as many hurricanes, maybe a couple other types of natural disasters, hopefully not. But this way, my eggs aren't all in one basket. So if something were to happen to one group of properties, the other will still, in fact, be there. Now, the other type is asset class diversification, and this is a pretty useful one as well. So when it comes to 1031 exchanges, you don't just have to exchange residential for, say, residential. You can exchange into different types of assets, such as retail, multifamily, or even industrial. Now, let's say that you own a shopping center somewhere in a tertiary market which is anchored by maybe a Lowe's. Now, I'm sure many of you know, but as of recently, big box retail has been hit very hard uh, by e-commerce and companies such as, say, Amazon. So if something were to happen to that Lowe's, that anchor tenant, that can do some serious damage to that property's income and make it be worth a lot less in the long run. Now, if you can foresee this, what you can hopefully do is you can do a 1031 exchange, sell that retail center, and maybe purchase a different type of asset, such as a multifamily building that can generate an even greater return on investment, and also one that isn't susceptible to such large market shifts. So that's another reason it's very powerful. And last is long-time ownership issues. So... Maybe you own a property that's about four or five hours away that has a lot of problems with it. Maybe there are a ton of reeks, some issues with the roof. Well, it also provides a relief of management burden. So that way you can maybe sell that property and purchase a new investment property closer to where you live so that you don't have to drive so far to manage it. And lastly, you can also exchange from, say, a fully depreciated property to a higher value property that can now be fully depreciated because you've already taken your depreciation schedule on the former property. So those are the four main reasons that investors exchange, and it's an incredibly powerful tool. And now what we're going to do is actually go over the tax breakdown when it comes to doing 1031 exchanges and see where all your taxes are really going to if you decide to cash out. Now, capital gains taxes are divided between federal and state capital gains. Now, at the federal level, you have essentially your federal income tax, which is you know, around 15 to 20%, depending on your level of income. And you also have a depreciation recapture tax, which is approximately 25% and a Medicare tax at around 3.8%. So that's at the federal level. Now you also have state income taxes. And for state income taxes, you know, it depends 
you know, a lot of Californians are around 9.3%, but, uh, you know, once all is said and done on an investment property, you're looking at a sale closer to 10.3% uh, to 12.3% on, uh, on the sale. So it's going to be a pretty uh, substantial number once all is said and done. And essentially, these taxes are a blended average that results at around 33%, as we mentioned earlier. Now, you, of course, you could talk to a tax advisor because that number may vary, but this is a rough number that we like to use for most examples, especially in California, where capital gains taxes are so high. And now what we want to do is actually do a little bit of gain calculation. What exactly is it that everybody is being taxed on when they sell their investment property? Well, essentially gain is what you're being taxed on and your gain is a function of your sales price and your adjusted basis. So you take your sale price and you subtract your adjusted basis to get to your gain. But then how do you calculate the gain and the adjusted basis? Well, with the adjusted basis, what you do is you, per you take your purchase price of the property that you're selling, you subtract depreciation and you add capital improvements and that's how you arrive at your adjusted basis, which you then subtract from your sale price to get to your gain. So let's use an example. Let's say you have a property that you initially purchased for $500,000, maybe 10 years ago. You've taken $100,000 of depreciation, added $25,000 in capital improvements, and now you're selling for a million dollars. Oh, can you guys hear us? I, I uh, for whatever reason, I couldn't hear Matt. Matt, can you hear me? Do we have an audio glitch here? If someone could let me know, I have to apologize. Matt was uh, was speaking really well, and then his mic might have gone out. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, um, if someone could let me know if you could hear me or not. All right, guys, I don't know if you can hear me, um, but I'm going to go ahead and pick up where Matt left off. Um, so what Matt was saying is, you know, really to understand these numbers is important. And I'm going to show you why in a couple slides, too. But um, what happens is, you're taxed on your gain, um, as Matt mentioned, but you got to really understand what your basis is. So let's go ahead and, uh, okay, so a bunch of people, it looks like we had a, uh, a glitch. I don't know, a, a bunch of emails, a bunch of stuff just came in. So, hey, I apologize for that. Looks like maybe we had an internet glitch or something. But uh, So to get your adjusted basis, you're going to have your purchase price minus your depreciation plus your basis, all right? And that gives you a number of 425000 And all you do there is you subtract it from your sale price, right? So anything above your adjusted basis is gain. And in this situation, we've got $575,000 of gain. Now, what's going to happen is your CPA is going to crunch the numbers at the end of the year. And they're actually going to do all these little calculations on these line-by-line -line taxes to come up with a number that you're going to owe, right? And that number in this example, based on our small sale here, well, not small, it's a million dollar sale, but based on our sale, we've got $192,000 of tax liability, all right? And if you kind of do some back of the uh, napkin numbers, you're going to note that that's about 33% or pretty close to 33% of our gain there. So we always tell people, hey, about 33% is going to go to the government. Uh, and when you break it down with a kind of fine tooth comb, you got to really look at each one of these individual tax rates and uh, your CPA can crunch those numbers for you. But if you're just looking at grand kind of big picture, use an estimate of about 33%. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I am not interested in it interested in it 
in paying $192,000 to the government at all. And the good thing is that you potentially don't have to, right? The good thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that you are selling real estate. And real estate is the most tax advantaged investment there is, right? And the type of tax breaks that you get depend on the type of real estate that you sell. So very, very important. Everybody look at your computer screen if you're not. There are two tax laws that will be involved in almost every real estate deal that you do. The first is section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code, what my company specializes in. And the second is section 121 of the Internal Revenue Code. Now keep in mind, if you are going to take advantage of section 121, you are not going to call me. You're not gonna call Matt. You're doing a primary residence sale, okay? Section 121 is for those of you who are selling your homes, and what section 121 says is that if you have lived in your home for two out of the past five years, when you sell it, you can completely avoid paying taxes on the first $250,000 of gain if you're single, $500,000 of gain if you are married. Now, you guys are all probably somewhat familiar with that, if not intimately familiar with that, having maybe taken it on your own, on your sale. You know that you don't need to use an accommodator, you don't need to do anything special, you just file uh, your tax return and claim that exemption. So every once in a while we get people who think they need to use us to take their homeowner's exemptions, uh, that is not the case. Now, of course, where you do need to use an accommodator is if you are doing an investment property sale, right? Section 1031 comes into play. You have the opportunity to defer taxes on the sale of that property, provided you go out and reinvest into another property. All right, so very important, ladies and gentlemen, two tax laws that you guys should know about Section 1031, deferral. Section 121, tax avoidance. Now, one's for your investment property, one's for your home. So that's going to cover almost every type of real estate that you're going to sell. Now, let me pose a question to you guys who are paying attention. What type of real estate could you potentially sell that would not be an investment and would not be your home? How about a second home? Okay. Is a second home eligible for 1031 tax deferral? No, because it's not rented out. Is a second home your primary residence and eligible for tax avoidance? No. All right. There are properties, of course, that don't qualify for either tax break. So you, you need to make sure that you uh, are getting good advice on whether your properties qualify or not. We can certainly help you out with that. But absolutely, there are properties when you sell, you're just going to pay taxes on. Now, the flip side of that is that there are some properties that you will sell that could potentially qualify for both of these tax laws, all right? Let me give you an example. You are selling a beautiful two-bedroom building in downtown LA, all right? You live in the top unit. It's your primary residence. The bottom unit is an investment property. When you sell that property, even though it's just one property with one buyer, with one escrow, you can absolutely claim both of these pieces of tax break, right? These two tax laws come into play because part of your property is your primary residence and eligible for the homeowner's exemption, and part of the property is an investment and eligible for Section 1031. So we work with clients who are taking advantage of both of these proper excuse me, both of these tax laws on the sale of one property all the time. And it doesn't have to be a two-unit building, right? It could be a four-unit building. Maybe you just live in 25% of it and you rent out 75%. I actually worked with a client selling a 60-acre farm, all right? There was a tiny little house on it. Client was selling the entire property with the house. The value of the house got the 10, excuse me, the value of the house got the homeowner's exemption and the value of the 60 acres got the 1031 exchange. So this was a sizable transaction. It was a $5 million sale. And guess what? Our clients walked away paying absolutely nothing to the tax man. All right. That is a very, very good thing. We saved our clients 
We saved our clients in this case over a million dollars in potential tax liability. All right, so knowledge is power. You got to know what tax breaks you're available for. You got to know the rules. Maybe you can change your second home when you're going to sell it into your primary with some planning or into an investment property so that you can qualify, right? We routinely save our clients hundreds of thousands of dollars with these type with these kinds of strategies. So very 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 important. All right. Now, before I move on, I do want to make one other point. Okay. And the point is this you have two tax laws. One is a deferral and one is avoidance. Which one is better? It's always better to avoid paying taxes, right? It is always better to avoid paying taxes than to defer them because defer them, but deferring means you don't have to pay today, but you're not off the hook, right? So with the section 1031, the fantastic wealth building tool that it is, it does have a flaw. The flaw is this, once you stop exchanging, you pay your taxes. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, you pay your taxes on all of the gain that you've built up over the lifetime of investing. Let me give you a quick example. Once again, eyeballs on the screen. If you're if you're doing something else, looking at YouTube, look here. You've got a two-unit building. You're going to exchange into a four-unit. You don't pay taxes because you've deferred via 1031. You sell the four-unit. You go to a 10-unit. No more taxes because you've deferred in an exchange. You do one more. You sell the 20. Excuse me. You sell the 10-unit to exchange into a 20-unit building. This took you 35 years. You've never paid a dime on any of these transactions to the government. All of your wealth has been rolled into bigger and better properties with bigger and better rental income. You are now retired, ladies and gentlemen, sitting on the beach and earning income, passive income, and living off it from your 20-unit apartment building. But the problem is you're sick and tired of managing it. So you want to sell it. You want to be done with real estate. So you put it on the market. You get an offer right away for $5 million bucks, And you sell it. Well, when you do that, you're paying taxes on the gains from this property, from this property, and all of the previous exchange properties that got you there. So what you've done over your 35 years of investing is you have created a giant tax snowball that has gotten bigger and bigger with every successful transaction that you've done. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a beautiful thing because you have been extremely successful with all of your investments. But the bad thing is that now you cashed out and you didn't call Matt before you did so. Because Matt would have told you, don't do it. Because if you do, you're going to pay $1.2 million in taxes to the government. Here's what Matt would have told you had you called him. Don't sell. Own that property till you die. And what happens when you die is the three Ds. You've deferred, you've deferred, and you die. The three Ds of investing. When you pass away you get a step up in basis. That basis that we taught you how to calculate in the previous couple slides steps up to fair market value for your heirs. You're dead, right? So who gets your property? Your kids do, or maybe I do because you don't have any kids. So I inherit your $5 million property that has a basis of $100,000 for you. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Boom. You pass away. The basis steps up to five million bucks. For me, I put the property on the market the day after your funeral. I get five million dollar offers with a five million dollar basis. I have zero capital gains taxes. All right, a phenomenal estate planning tool, a fantastic way to completely eliminate your investment property capital gains taxes. All you have to do is die. All right? It's going to happen, so plan for it. Now, some of you might just say, you know what? I can't wait till I die. i got to cash out. That's fine. 
right? People pay taxes all the time. I had a 87 year old lady pay her taxes on a $3 million building just because she didn't want to deal with it. She had a ton of money, just didn't want to deal with the exchange, too much heartache. So she paid her taxes. Hey, you know, whatever floats your boat, but this defer, defer, die strategy is fantastic. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to do these great strategies, you got to do them correctly. All right. We talked about the consequences of not doing them correctly or cheating. So what I want to have in the next couple slides is Matt walk you through how to successfully do your 1031 exchanges. So Matt, are you back online, buddy? Yep, back on. And thanks for taking over on the, uh, the last couple slides there. Yep, go ahead, take uh, take over and, and walk them through the, the guidelines for successful exchange. Yeah, so essentially there are four main guidelines that you want to keep in mind when you do your 1031 exchange so that your property qualifies and that you have a successful exchange. And the first is the property qualifications. The, sex, the second is the tax deferral requirements. Third is the timelines. And the last is the identification rules. Now let's go over each one of those. Now the first guideline is that the properties involved in the exchange must qualify, meaning that they need to be used for productive use in trade or business or for investment. So if you have a property that you are say, renting out to uh, some renters who are living there, or it's a property that you're using for your own personal business, that will qualify for a 1031 exchange. Now, what you ideally want to do is have rental income on those properties, certainly if it's an investment, for one to two years prior to doing the exchange, preferably two, so that your property will in fact qualify. And the reason is that the IRS is essentially looking at intent when you do a 1031 exchange. Uh, they wanna see that you've held the property that you're selling for business or investment purposes, and the amount of time that you have rented out that property prior to selling it is what they use to determine whether or not it was an investment. So two years is the safe bet for, or two years or greater is really a safe bet for whether or not your property will qualify for 1031. Anything less, you wanna to talk to your CPA about that, but we like to recommend two years as the safe number. And you also want to make sure that the properties are like kind and like kind is somewhat confusing for people because they think that like kind means the properties in the exchange need to be of the same type, meaning that you have to sell a single family residence and purchase a single family residence or sell an office building and purchase an office building. That's in fact not the case. You can really sell and purchase any kind of real estate you want. You can exchange land for a single family residence, a single family residence for say a multi-family apartment building or multi-family apartment building for an office building. The type of real estate actually doesn't matter so long as they are in fact used for business or investment. Now, there are a couple things that do not constitute like kind. And the first is foreign property. So if you're selling a single family residence in California and want to purchase uh, some small space somewhere in the French Riviera, unfortunately you cannot do that. And we get that question pretty often is, you know, can we exchange outside of the country? Maybe I want to purchase a little vacation home or something outside in maybe France, or we've actually had somebody ask us if they can exchange into Iceland. So really all over the map. And unfortunately they cannot do that the properties involved have to be within the US. And quick flips are also not like kind. And this is another very common question. So people will ask us, can we sell an investment property and then purchase a home that we're going to do some renovations on and then sell it once we complete the improvements? And that does not work. And the reason is because quick, fl quick flips are considered to be inventory. They're not investment. And the reason is because the money being made is from the improvements that you're making on the property as well as from the sale and not from actual income generation or appreciation of the property value. So that's why quick flips don't 
work for 1031 exchanges. And uh, we'll move on to the next guideline, which is going to be about how much real estate you, in fact, have to purchase in order for it to qualify. Now, if your goal of the 1031 exchange is to defer 100% of your tax liability, you want to purchase property of equal or greater value to what you sold and reinvest all the cash from the sale. So let's look at a, an example. Let's say you have a property that you sell for a million dollars and you want to defer 100% of your tax liability and you have 500,000 in cash. Well, first you want to make sure that you purchase property equal to or greater value than a million dollars. And then if you have say 500,000 in cash, you reinvest that money into the new property. Now, a lot of people ask us, what about if I don't want to purchase equal or greater value? Can I actually trade down in value? So say, maybe sell for a million and purchase for $900,000. Well, you actually can, in fact, do that. But what you want to know is that the difference between what you sold and what you purchased is subject to capital gains taxes. So in this example, if you sold for a million and purchased for 900,000, you have $100,000 in taxable gain that you know, will be subject to capital gains taxes once you complete the exchange. And if you're looking at that round number of 33%, then approximately 33% of that $100,000 of gain is going to go to the government. So just something to keep in mind when you do your 1031 exchange, because if you don't want to pay any taxes, you need to remember to purchase equal or greater value and to reinvest all the cash from the sale. Now let's also go over some of our timelines. Now there are two timelines you need to keep in mind when you do your 1031 exchange. The first is that you have 180 days from the date of close of escrow to complete the purchase of your replacement properties. And these are calendar days, and there aren't any extensions on this timeline. The only way that you're ever going to get an extension is if there is a presidential disaster declaration in the area affecting the property that you're purchasing. So, sure, you've heard of some of the, you know, Napa wild, well, the Napa fires from last year, I believe in Sonoma as well, uh, that it caused a lot of damage, and a lot of our clients did, in fact, get extensions on their timelines. But for purposes of your exchange, don't plan on there being a presidential disaster declaration when you do your exchange and consider that timeline to be airtight. Now, the second timeline is the 45-day identification period. And this will probably be the hardest part about the 1031 exchange because by day 45 following close of escrow on your sale, you need to send a letter to us saying, here are the properties that I intend to purchase. Now, it doesn't mean you need to be in contract on those properties or even be in escrow, but you have to know which properties you want to choose from. And once day 45 passes, that list is final. So up until day 45, you can send properties to us. And if, say, one falls off the market, you can amend your ID letter and send it back. But that's only up until day 45. Once day 45 is done, that timeline is over. So just remember that when you do your own exchange. And the last guideline is actually the identification requirements themselves. Because there are some rules about how you identify properties on that ID letter. Now the first is called the three property rule. And then the second is the 200% rule. So we'll go over each of those uh, right now. Now, the three property rule allows you to identify up to three properties regardless of their value when you sell your property. And of course, they could be of any property type. So it could be anything from a million dollar home to a $20 million apartment building. Um, that's completely fine. Up to three properties, you aren't limited by that value. And this might be a good rule to go by if your goal is, say, wealth generation and you want to purchase a property that generates an even greater return. Now, if 
the goal is, say, diversification, then the better rule to go by might actually be the 200% rule. And with this rule, you can identify four properties or greater up to as many properties as you would like, but the combined value of those properties can't exceed 200% of the value of the property you sell. So let's say you sell this office building for, I don't know, a million dollars, right? Looks like it might be worth a little more, but we'll just use that number for an easy example. And then you want to sell that, purchase six single family residences. Well, certainly allowed, but because now you're above three, the combined value of those properties can't exceed 200% of the value of the property you're selling. So in this situation, you have a million dollar office building. You could purchase six single family residences up to $2 million in value. Which rule that you essentially use is up to you. Picking one or the other is really dependent on what you feel your best reinvestment strategy is when it comes to 1031 exchanging. Is your goal wealth generation or is it diversification? Depending on that, one rule might in fact be better than the other. And those are essentially the four main guidelines that you want to keep in mind when you do your exchange. And if you know these four guidelines, you're well on your way to at least having a sense of if your property is going to qualify for a 1031 exchange. And you'll have a lot of questions along the way, which you could of course, ask Leonard or I, but at least knowing these gives you a very good sense of how everything works and whether you're on track to having a successful 1031. And with that, I will turn it back to Leonard. All right. Thanks, Matt. And uh, well explained. Um, what I want to do is um, I'm going to jump real quick into opportunity zones. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left and I'm going to cover reverse exchanges and answer everybody's questions. But what I want to do right now is clear up um, some misinformation about opportunity zones. Okay. Um, I will tell you that from my perspective, I don't think any of our exchange clients are going to get into or benefit from the opportunity zones. All right. If you dig into the regulations and the guidance from the treasury department, um, the people that I think are going to benefit from opportunity zones are sophisticated developers. Now, you might be a sophisticated developer, um, but a general exchange client looking to uh, you know, sell a property and buy something, you can't just go out and sell a property in, 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 let's say, San Francisco and go into an opportunity zone and say, hey, I qualify. Doesn't work that way, all right? So here are some of the guidelines, opportunity zones. There's about 8,700 of them in the country. Um, the bad thing is they're in, you know, not great areas, right? So the poverty rate is much higher in these zones. Um, the other thing is the investment in the opportunity ha zone has to be done through a fund. So it's funny. I got an email the other day um, from a client pitching a listing. And he said, this listing is perfect. It's in the opportunity zone. Come take advantage of it. Well, if you're an unsophisticated client, you've heard about this great thing in the news, you're like, heck yeah, I'll buy that building, get to, you know, defer a bunch of taxes by going out and buying it. Well, no, you've got to create a fund. And there's all kinds of regulations on how the fund is created and how it's structured and the tax reporting for the fund. Okay. But the good thing is, if you're willing to go out and create that fund and do all this work and hire the attorneys to make sure it's done correctly, you can use the fund to go out and buy that property. And the money that you use to pay for that property that you want to buy can come from any type of asset with capital gains. All right. So not just real estate, stocks and bonds work as well. Sale of a business would qualify as well. All right. So that could be worthwhile, right? Checking into. So you might want to talk to your attorney. If you've got a ton of gains in the stock market, well, how much is it going to cost me to put together this fund what are the structures, what are the reporting from a tax perspective that I'm going to have to do once I do that fund? And can I then buy this property in the opportunity zone? All right. If you end up doing it, you're going to have to have the fund invest 90% of its total assets in that zone. And then there's some great tax benefits, right? So what happens is the original capital gains taxes are going to be deferred until the opportunity zone 
investment is sold or till 2026, all right? So you can defer the original gains. Now, there's also some benefit. If you hold it for a full five years, you get a 10% reduction in the amount of taxes owed. You hold it for seven years, um, that's supposed to be 15%. My slide is wrong. You'll get a 15% reduction in the amount of taxes owed. Okay, so there are some investments. And then if you hold it for a full 10 years, any new gain that you get may be excluded from taxes. All right, your original gain is never excluded from taxes, all right? So if you brought a million dollars of gain into the investment, you will absolutely pay taxes on that now. You might get a 10 or 15% reduction, okay? If you hold it for five or seven years. But that original gain, you're going to pay taxes on when you sell. And then any new gain could be excluded, all right? So that's good, right? We don't like paying taxes, so that's really good. Now let me tell you the bad thing. Within 30 months of the acquisition of the property, you need to do substantial improvements to that property and the amount of improvements must double your basis. So if you bring a million dollars into the property, within 30 months, you got to put another million bucks into the property. Bet you didn't know that. Maybe you did. Maybe you're a developer and you're saying, hey, that's fantastic. I'm going to go buy this warehouse. I'm going to fix it up. Or maybe I already own a warehouse. I'm going to create a fund for investors to come in and help me fix up this warehouse. And I'm going to convert it to high-end condos because this area and this opportunity zone is going to transition to a much better neighborhood. Right? Could be. All right? The other thing is the government is shut down right now. Um, we were expecting further clarification on some of these really – confusing rules that they put out, um, but they haven't told us yet. I got an email or one of my staff got an email today from a uh, in, uh, investment group that was putting together an opportunity fund to go out and buy this giant apartment complex and they had to cancel it because the treasury department didn't release their further guidelines and clarifications. All right, so here's the word of caution that I like to give people is do your homework. You can't just go buy a building in one of these zones and say, woohoo, it's in an opportunity zone, I get the tax break. Nope, doesn't work like that, all right? If you're a sophisticated investor, you got a good team of attorneys and CPAs, then absolutely, you know, if it's something you want to look into, look into it. I had lunch with a uh, a very high-end uh, partner, uh, excuse me, a, very, a partner, a very high-end CPA firm yesterday. He said for every 30 calls he got about opportunity zones, he's doing maybe one or two actual kind of deals. So a lot of interest, but, you know, with the government, it's going to take, you know, a year or two before these regulations are really kind of sussed out to where people feel really confident that they've got a good program for how to take advantage of it. So absolutely, if you want to go out and figure it out on your own, you know, get some good attorneys on your team and, and, and you can make it happen, I'm sure. All right, so that's my two cents on Opportunity Zones. And we've done a lot of homework and had a lot of discussions uh, about these. So, um, you know, I, I think we're doing a good job in illustrating some of uh, the, the advantages and, and disadvantages. All right, now I'm running out of time, so I do want to um, skip through a couple slides because I, t I promised uh, somebody that I would talk about the reverse exchange. And so let's do that. A reverse exchange is simply an exchange done in reverse. So instead of selling and then and buying, you do the opposite. You buy first and then you sell, okay? So why do you do that? Well, tons of reasons, right? You found a great property, you got to get it. Uh, you're in a competitive bidding environment. You're afraid that if you sell, you're going to get outbid on everything. Or maybe you thought you were going to sell your property. It was in escrow. You went out and made an offer on a new property, but your escrow fell through. Or maybe it just didn't get enough offers, right? So lots of reason to w maybe want to buy first in a 1031 exchange. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is it's very difficult to conduct a reverse exchange. 
Why is that? Well, because you, the taxpayer, cannot own the new property and the old property at the same time. You cannot own both of these at the same time. That's not an exchange. An exchange is going from one to another, right? You can't just go out and buy two buildings and eventually sell one and say, well, I just did a reverse. Nope, doesn't work that way. In order to do a reverse exchange, my company will come in and take title to one of the properties for you. Now, we like to take title to the new property. We become the buyer of the new property for you. And once you sell your property, we can transfer the new one to you. All right? It's a little shell game, right? We just buy the property. We become, we become the straw buyer for you. Once your building sells within 180 days, we will then transfer the new property to you. Sounds easy, right? Well, it's not. And the reason why is because lenders don't like to loan you money for property we are taking title to. So the biggest issue we have is the financing. Now, some people say, well, that's okay. I'm paying all cash. Well, the next biggest issue we have is that when we take title to this property, there is a transfer tax. And then when you take title to the property, there's another transfer tax. So you've got to pay duplicate transfer taxes. And then the other thing is our fee is a lot higher, right? Because we are now on the chain of title. We are now exposing ourselves to a lot of liability. So you're looking at a $6,500 fee to do a reverse exchange. You know, between transfer taxes, escrow title, and an exchange fee, a reverse exchange could easily get up to fifteen dollars to $20,000. All right, so here's my idea. Try to avoid it if you can, All right? Can you delay the purchase of the property a few weeks so that you can get this one sold, All right? Have a conversation with the parties involved. You can bribe them. You know you're gonna pay $20,000 to do a reverse exchange. Give the other party five or $10,000 to delay so that you can get your property sold. How about that? All right, that is the reverse exchange. And I sped through that pretty quickly, but uh, the point I want you to take away from the reverse exchange discussion is they're just not easy. For every 10 conversations I have about reverse exchange, I do maybe one, maybe. All right, people hear about them through the grapevine. They think they're a great thing. Their mortgage broker told, oh, just buy your property first. I want to get this loan out, right? Well, eh, not so easy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 3.02. I apologize. I take pride in starting and ending on time. Um, if you have to go, please go ahead and leave, but only after you hear my sales pitch. And my sales pitch is this. Ladies and gentlemen, if you thought we did a good job today, please give us an opportunity to earn your business. All right, we're going to give the same impression to your clients if you're making a referral. We're going to give the same impression to you throughout the course of your exchange. All right, we are interested in building lifelong clients. Don't take my webinar and then go to someone else because they're $50 cheaper. Have a conversation with me, right? Tell me, hey, Leonard, your prices are $50 more. Well, we can work with you, right? We're not going to uh, lose a client over a little bit of uh, money because we want to work with you for the next 25 years. If you refer us to a client, we are going to make you look good. I know that realtors, if you refer someone to a, uh, a vendor and they drop the ball, it makes you look awful. We know that and we will never, ever do it, okay? And I'll tell you that I've been doing this for a long time. My uh, partner is a tax attorney who is often asked to be an expert witness in tax cases. Nobody knows 1031 Exchange better than us, all right? Now, my contact information is on the slide. If you have questions, um, please give us a call. Shoot me an email. Um, Matt is also available at this phone number. I got to put Matt's uh, email on here. I apologize for that. But uh, you can contact either of us at this number right here. Okay. Now, there's a bunch of questions. So I'm going to go ahead and cycle through these questions and make sure that you guys get all your answers. If you do have to drop off the line, Thank you very much for joining us today. So I know this isn't fair, but I'm going to kind of skip around on the questions. 
uh, because some of them are easier to answer and I can get them done right away. So uh, Chelsea wants to know, what if you changed a second home into an investment and began renting it? Well, we talked a little bit about that, right? You could absolutely do that. So Chelsea, you can rent out your second home, do it for two years, and then when you are done renting it out for two years, it will absolutely be eligible for 1031 exchange. Chelsea also wants to know, well, what happens if I have a loss on my investment? Well, if you have a loss and you don't have any gain, there's no taxes. Okay. Now you could have a loss on your property, however, and still have to do an exchange though. Let me give you an example. You bought a property for a million, you owned it for 10 years and you're selling it for a million. But over those 10 years, you have depreciated the property. And as Matt so eloquent, eloquently described before his phone cut out, there is a depreciation recapture tax. All right. So you got to keep that in mind. So just because you bought a property for a million and you're selling it for a million doesn't mean you don't have taxes. So talk to your CPA. Give us a call before you make a move. We'll kind of give you the back of the napkin numbers on whether or not you might even have to call your CPA to get a real accurate assessment. All right. So Lan wants to know if she sold for a million and she buys for 900, does she have $100,000 worth of boot? Absolutely, and that is taxable. So anytime you trade down in value, ladies and gentlemen, you pay taxes on the difference. Roseanne says, how long can the heirs hold the property and what happens when they sell it? Well, geez, right? You can hold the property that you inherit for as long as you want. But if you, during your ownership, get some gain, that new gain will be taxable. All right, so you inherit a property, the basis steps up, but then if you hold it for another 20 years and that a property appreciates in those 20 years and you start depreciating it, well, you've got 20 years of appreciation and depreciation to deal with and we know that there will be a tax bill. Does identified uh, value have to be the same as the purchase price? For example, I estimated 500, but I ended up purchasing for 700. Very good question, Lan. So what happens is Lan is talking about the, well, any identification rule, right? On my letter, I'm going to say, well, this property is worth $500,000, but ended up in contract at 700. That could be a problem if it is substantially different and you are using the 200% rule. However, I will tell you that I've never seen an auditor argue over the values that have been listed on an ID letter as long as they are reasonable, right? So what's reasonable? Well, if the property is listed for 500 and you put 500, but you get into a bidding war and you end up buying it for 700, well, I can argue that all day long. All right, so what we want to do when we're working with the tax law is be able to defend our position. And the more supporting documentation you have, that's going to help. Now, Linda says, can you move into a single family home for two years that's been rented out for 15 and then sell as a primary? Absolutely. All right, so let's look at this, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a property that has a timeline. And for 15 years, it's been rented. And then we move into it for two. And we do this because we want to move in, convert it to a primary, and sell it and take advantage of the homeowner's exemption. We can do that. However, what the government does is they said all of the gains allocated to the rental period are not eligible to be covered under the homeowner's exemption. And how do we figure out how much gain is associated with this rental period? Well, it's pretty simple. It's a pro rata amount. We've owned it for 17 years total, and we've rented it for 15. So 15 seventeenths of our gain is taxable. The other two seventeenths can be sheltered under the homeowner's exemption. 
And Gerald, I think I just answered your question. Oh, no, I didn't. So Gerald's got the opposite question. Gerald says, we're going to do this. So we, in, la in, the, in the previous example, we had a rental that we converted to a home. Now what we have is a home we're going to move out of and we're going to rent. What happens in that situation, ladies and gentlemen? Well, as long as you rent the property for two years and as long as you have lived in the property for three out of the past, excuse me, two out of the past five years, you can do a 1031 exchange and take your homeowner's exemption. Okay, let's look at this closely. So when we judge a property's eligibility for 1031 exchange, we do a look back for the last two years and we say, has it been rented out? And if the answer is yes, then you can qualify for 1031. All right. Now, when we're looking at the homeowner's exemption, we look back five years and we say, have you lived in it for two of the past five years? If the answer is yes, you, el you are eligible for Section 121. In this situation, the answer to both is yes. So in this situation, you can do a 1031 exchange and take your homeowner's exemption. So the property sells for $1 million. You are married. The first $500,000 comes out completely tax-free via the homeowner's exemption, the remaining value of $500,000 is now eligible for 1031. Ladies and gentlemen, did I just blow your mind? I think I did, because that is a phenomenal strategy. You could theoretically buy a property for $100,000 as your primary residence 50 years ago, you could now put it on the market for $5 million. You could, before you sell it, two years, rent it out. And then you, when you do sell for $5 million, you can do an exchange and also take your homeowner's exemption. And you can walk away from that $5 million sale without paying a dime to the government. Mic drop. Right? We're done. That's the best thing I've taught you all day. Well, besides our my phone number. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a pleasure doing the webinar with you today. And we are going to end. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Keep us in mind if you have any questions about the 1031 exchange process. If you need anything, please shoot us an email. Send me an email or give me a call. Matt is a phenomenal resource. He's going to answer the phone first before any phone calls come to me. So if you do call, you'll probably talk to Matt, but you will be in very good hands. Ladies and gentlemen, have an awesome Wednesday. We look forward to working with you really soon. Take care. Take care, everybody.